Thank you all for tuning in. The following is a presentation of Bald Spots Productions. Be sure to like, comment, and share. You know, subscribe, follow, whatever it is you've got to do to kick that algorithm into gear and help us reach more people. It is I, your humble host, Bill Hatch the Third, coming to you live from the palatial remote studios of Bald Spots Productions, temporarily in the beautiful town of Branson, Missouri. Um, coming to you for, uh, for, for, because, well, I'm here because there's Christmas stuff going on. And, uh, um, and so, uh, so yeah, just out here with the family having some fun. And, uh, I'm joined at, uh, at more than acceptable safe social distances my, by my guests today, Andrew Fitzgerald and Brock Agetz. How you doing? Great. Hey, Bill. Hey, Brock. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> well, um. I will. I will start my. Uh, I will start my questioning, my my interrogation, as it were, uh, with the same question I always ask: What are you reading, Andrew? We'll start with you since you're the new guest. Um, right. What or who are you reading? Well, I'm a new guest, but I've been a long time listener and a first time caller. That old chest. Oh, I'm so sorry. right now, I'm reading uh, "Shoe Dog" by Phil Knight, the guy that uh, came up with the concept of Nike. Uh, okay. So I'm really enjoying that. So that's where I'm at at the moment. But I have a lot more books for Christmas right on the table to be dived into. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been uh, even while I'm away from home, books have been showing up at my doorstep. So, <laughs> books so I life. know that for sure. How about you, Bronco? What are you reading? I'm reading um, a book called Vibration Energy, and um, and I forgot who the author is. Should I go check? Should I go look with the? No, the it's okay. Okay, <laughs> but it's really it's very <laughs> it's a very mind expanding book. I'm loving it. Yeah. Great, great. Yeah, always love to hear about what uh, what people are reading about and uh, um, and all. But uh, uh, before uh, before we started recording, started talking about a little bit about what's going on over there in uh, in Israel. Um, Really, uh, a bunch of tragedy uh, is is what it is, um, you know. And uh, but uh, but some uh, some bits and pieces of goodness uh, for sure. Uh, talking about uh, the young lady from uh, from Ireland who uh, managed to uh, uh. get her way home after uh, after being taken hostage. That's right. just uh, amazing um, how uh, how all that's going. Oh, yes. It really is. Are you Every, uh, are you near yeah. any of that, uh, Bracca? I okay. Are you near well, any of that? Well, there were missiles coming to my town that I'm in, but right now there are not. Um, actually, I think it was a mistake. Oh, the missiles that you, that came here before, I think, were mistakes. They were not meant to come here um, because our town is surrounded by Arab. Um, we're surrounded by Arab towns, so it's not really okay. a place that they would want to to uh, bomb. Um, but mm. we've had we've had problems with infiltration um, of terrorists breaking oh, in. So, um, wow. yeah, right now the people in our town have gotten more arms, and. Um, mm -hmm. It, we, we we had one really scary night. I thought I thought my life was over that night. I really did. It was. It's almost a funny story because it's a it's crazy what happened. Um, it was it was the Sabbath, so it was Friday night, and um, we'd eat. Mm -hmm. Everybody had eaten dinner. There's no cars in our town when it's the Sabbath, so. Right. All of a sudden, um, we would talk, we, we, we usually turn off all our uh, technology, but we, we were told to leave it on mm -hmm. because things were dangerous. Um, and we hear these sounds mm -hmm. and we hear loudspeakers that there's been a terrorist infiltration. So um, what happened was they, they told us, you know, close all your windows, shut, lock all your doors and everything. And we, everything was dark. And my husband and I are just sitting here like, okay, it was 917. I remember when it started 
and we're just sitting here silently and then we hear like a lot of noise outside the window. Motors running, dogs barking, all kinds of activity going on. We don't know what's happening. And then all of a sudden we hear pounding on our door and they're screaming, open the door. So I thought that was it. I thought our lives were over. I'm not kidding. Because I had heard that in the kibbutz, they were screaming at them, open your doors. Because everybody, the loudspeakers had told us to shut our doors. Why are they telling us bounding on the door to open the door? We thought the terrorist was here because we're on the first floor. We're on the ground level. So we were standing there mm -hmm. in front of the door. I, I can't explain it. I couldn't move. I didn't even duck. I just was frozen in place. I was right there in front of the door and I thought this is it, you know, because they could just shoot right through the door, just like in the kibbutz. It turned out it was the army coming to make sure everybody was okay. It was really stupid to tell us to open the door because they had all told us to lock our doors, you know? So it was, it was the army and I had nothing to worry about at that moment. But I thought, I honestly thought that was the end of my life because I was like just a few feet away from the door when they're wow. screaming and pounding on the door, open the door. And like, I wasn't going to talk, nothing, because I didn't want to let them know there was someone right there. You know, It was crazy. But right. it ended up, um, they had thrown in um, like grenades, you know, over the fence, very close to the fence. And they the grenades had made a hole in the fence and they thought that there was infiltration of, um, um, you know, mm. people trying to kill us, but it, it was not, it was all just um, only that they'd thrown grenades at us. And, and so this, the station was right in front of our, our window. So we heard all this commotion, the entire thing was happening right here, you know? So finally by 1130, there was an all clear, but that night, I actually thought my life was over and it was ridiculous because it was actually the army trying to protect us. But who's to know? You don't know. Even if we'd seen them, we wouldn't have believed because we know they dress up in the, in, as a disguise. So you don't know who to trust, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a crazy way to live. Sounds like it. Yeah. Okay. So what exciting things are happening in your life, Andrew? <laughs> well, so we're, yeah, I mean, that's a tough one to follow. I think that uh, in, uh, uh, rough and tumble Oceanside. So yeah, I'm in Oceanside <laughs> in Southern California, but hopefully I still have my accent. So I'm from Ireland originally. And uh, my wife and I settled out here 12 years ago. She's from Ireland as well. We're from a place called County Cork. And we have a five year old boy, Alfie. So uh, and good news just in, uh, in the last two weeks, we became US citizens. So my oh, wife and I, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you went through the nationalization wow. ceremony. It was beautiful. It was great. And I think there was 32 other countries there on the day. Wow. Nationalities. Wow. So very much home for us now. We're looking forward to Christmas week this week. But Raka, that sounds like a, a terrifying experience. Um, at the start, we were talking about humanity and war. But like, I mean, wars are always about, you know, land or religion. And if you think back to Northern Ireland, which was, you know, a big oh, war, yeah. we called it the Troubles in the 80s. Yes, but um, it was pretty similar to that. But uh, hopefully, you you guys will all still be safe and careful. And hopefully, there's a resolution somehow. I don't know what how that's going to happen, but we know exactly. We mm -hmm. just want to live in peace. You know, it's like, but it's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's such a tiny little area. Why we're here almost mm -hmm. makes no sense at all, because uh, it's 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 ninety nine point six percent Arab all around us and there's this 0.4 percent which is what we're calling a jewish state right now in the midst of all this you know it's it's miraculous that we exist for one second i really think because i didn't even know how we're existing you know yes yeah well uh on to uh on to more pleasant things um let's see uh brock i saw that you have uh you have some books out um right now did you you wrote uh, you wrote some stuff for hanukkah you should know that when when we were in lockdown like we couldn't come out of the apartment for like a week or two weeks i wrote like three more manuscripts i got so motivated to write while i was here 
stuck in here and I couldn't go any place that I wrote these stories that I've been wanting to write for ages because I had the time to do it, you know? So you never know. Like one book, it's really funny. It's not out yet, it's just a manuscript, but a book about how to be a good friend. I'm writing this while the war is like, whoa, happening. And, my, and that's the title of the book, you know? It's just, you never okay. know how these things happen, you know? <laughs> How to be a good friend, anyway. <laughs> no, but my the no, new book, yeah, the new sounds like a time to write that. Right, exactly, exactly. Yes, we do. We want peace. That's what we want. We just want to live peacefully, and uh, it will be amazing if it happens. Totally miraculous again. Um, yeah. So I sh mm -hmm. what I should talk about my new books. My newest books. Oh, it's it's don't read this book. Yeah, that's my newest um, picture book. And it's um, this book took me 30 years to write because I wrote it 30 years ago. I had the title. I had almost the whole book written and it didn't feel right. Like. And I kept working on it again, like through the years, maybe this will do it. No, but two years ago, I finally got the surprise ending and then I knew the book was ready to be published. So you never know with books, like, I feel like it's a channeling kind of thing, you know, it, it's when it's meant to come in the world. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty it's similar meant to, to me. me. It'll be. During COVID, uh, I had always wanted to write a book like a lot of people would say, hey, I'd love to write a book, but never do anything about it. And we had this all this time because we had to stay at home order in California. And my wife, Jane, would be great at pushing me. And she gave me a kick in the butt and said, start writing. So it took me two and a half years, but I wrote and published my own book, which is called, I hope you can see it. Uh, How did I get here? Traveling the road to resilience. Wow. Which is out. Cool. And... Um, it's all about my life. You know, you said you took 30 years to write your book. I'm 46 years of age, so it took me 46 years because it's a memoir about my life. And I really enjoyed it, but I, I wrote it really to leave a legacy for my son. So Alfie mm. has his copy put away, signed with a personal message. It's like wrapped so it won't get damaged. And um, he's five, I'm 46. So I just look at life a little bit differently. Like it was a little later starting, but at least it became a father, you know. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the book is, has been great. Really, I've really enjoyed it, but it's not my full-time job. Full-time job is working in the beverage business here in California, selling canned cocktails. <laughs> canned cocktails. Yeah. Oh, that sounds, uh, that sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, an Irish person selling alcohol, it's not too difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you, you stop being such a stereotype. <laughs> I know, yeah, it's, uh, it's so difficult. <laughs> So, but California is home now. We love it. I mean, I love, to, first of all, love the United States of America, but um, mm -hmm. California has built, it, like you mentioned, has become super expensive. In the 12 yeah. years that I've lived here, I've seen it every year, and my wages don't go up that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need to sell more alcohol. <laughs> That's a good, busy, busy couple of weeks coming up. It's good for sales. Yeah, yeah, I bet, I bet. What, uh, um, what took you to, uh, to California? Uh, yeah, so Jane and I always um, worked during college in the summer months. You know, we were always working in part-time jobs where our buddies would have gone traveling. So we never had that experience of taking, you know, the summer off during college to travel. And then a little later in life, we decided to travel and traveled all the West Coast, but spent a lot of time in Southern California and fell in love with San Diego. Uh -huh. And then we went back to Ireland and we kind of had an itch and we wanted to scratch it. But we figured out how, how could you move to America legally? Because you have to do that, right? It's important. Right. So we, we entered the green card lottery. So the America holds a, a diversity visa lottery every year. And it's it's oh. way of increasing Sorry about that. The, in, in case this it, it's 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 way of uh, increasing the diversity of the country if it's not diverse enough already. And they give out <laughs> fifty thousand visas. So my wife and I entered and we were lucky enough to be picked and we decided we'd wow. go for it. And we're here ever since. Wow, that's <laughs> that, awesome. So it was adventure, really, you know, more so than anything yeah. else. And then eventually we found work that was suitable for both of us. And yeah, look, it's been, a, it's been a tough time too moving. I mean, it's not like you just land somewhere. You have to fit in. You have to assimilate. You have to push yourself socially and personally. So, But it's great. 
I love the positivity yeah. of America. Yeah. Yeah, San Diego's a, a great place, though. Um, I always loved it. And Yeah, uh, very vibrant. Yeah. I mean, it, you make, it makes you want to go outdoors and do things and be sociable. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, but that's my benchmark, Bill and, and Branca. I haven't lived anywhere else in America, so that's my benchmark. I'm sure everywhere else is the same. <laughs> oh, San Diego is... <laughs> no. No, beautiful, beautiful weather. San Diego's weather, and it's similar to Israel. Israel has beautiful beautiful weather like right now it's the winter but it's it's like spring compared to the you know the northeast of where i'm from in america and mm -hmm. yeah it's it's really delightful um and what about your book resilience what is the resilience that you're talking about yeah so, so i had four just four key sections so resilience really is, is, as we all know, the power to overcome and survive and thrive and, and get over things and flourish. But I had four key sections. So at 19, I flatlined twice in Ireland. So uh, I had a, I oh, was wow. born with a, a genetic heart condition that I didn't know I had. And uh, it manifested itself the first time playing soccer afterwards. Wow. And I guess the only way to bring my heart down was to stop it in the hospital. So um, wow. thankfully I woke up. And the second time it happened, I was on a golf course. So not very, not very vigorous exercise, but it happened again. <laughs> wow. And the doctors into the ER and they said, the only way we have to medically induce a flatline. So I woke up again. And, and, and look, I think that those, I didn't deal with that situation a lot, but I was resilient to overcome it. And then the second piece of the book, the section is all about emigrating. So emigrating isn't a straight shot. You land in America and the American dream kicks in. You need to be resilient. Nice. Uh, the third one section is all about my corporate life in the drinks business. So I've worked with Heineken and Diageo, and I launched White Claw Hard Seltzer, which is one of the biggest brands here. But along mm -hmm. the way in the corporate world, I, what I call is the dark side of the corporate world, that you have to, you have, to have your own value system because it's going to get mm -hmm. compromised and you have to be resilient and you have to I've had situations where I've been thrown under the bus, as they say in the industry. And you either sink or swim. So I, I share experiences and tips and tricks on how to manage yourself in that environment. And I, I, again, the fourth section of the book is really personal. Um, my wife and I had four miscarriages, unfortunately, oh. in four years before Alfie was born. So that was a really tough time personally for both of us individually uh -huh. and collectively. But we were resilient again. But I think it, what, what, what the readers have been getting out of the book is the ability to reconcile some things in the past. So I never dealt with that serious heart condition. I never told anybody about it either. Wow. We were Irish. We didn't talk about things. And wow. I'm a man, so we don't talk about things either. And then also just the, the, the personal loss and miscarriage is tough too, you know. So I've had people that have bought the book have, have been reaching out and saying, look, well done, first of all, for writing it. And secondly, I got a lot out of it. So at the end of each section, I, I share some lessons i've learned from my experience in the hope that other people can can learn from it and it, it lives on amazon because it's the best way to get a book to everybody worldwide um, yeah. and i'm very proud of myself to do it uh, it took a long yeah. time it took two and a half years to write it and i and i had to get help i had to get an editor to help me because i'm not an expert on that and yeah that's what life is about too you got to reach out and get support for people so very resilient family as well my mom survived cancer and my brother survived Pretty cancer so Love cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. My my dearest of dear friend passed dear friends passed away a few years back uh, uh, from uh, um, from a couple different cancers and oh. yeah it's it, it can be rough to uh, um, to help take care of somebody who's uh, who's going through that. Um, talk about resilience. Um, but uh, yeah, I still live with her uh, with her widow with widower. Always got to get that straight. Can't call him a widow. <laughs> Widower. Widower. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, um, no, that's great. Um, yeah. Well, uh, tell me a little bit about, uh, cause I'm, I'm starting my book. I I'm like 38 pages in. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be on leadership. Um, go ahead, Brock. I just gonna say that's the hardest part, getting started. That's it. That's you. You've already passed yeah. the hardest part. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, so you self-published. Yes. So self-published. Um, 
I guess for me, I didn't realize what I, I, I no, sorry, I go backwards. I didn't know what I was doing, but it was never about publishing and, and, and um, finding an agent and all that. It was to mm-hmm. write a book, but self-publishing for me. So I, would, I was writing every Saturday, um, wow. not, getting, not getting a lot done, but eventually I decided to turn on the microphone on a Microsoft Word document and I started talking to the document, right? Uh-huh. So I was telling my story and then I found an editor to help me clear up the punctuation and, and phrase things correctly. Um, and we would meet every week and we would work through it. And she kind of held me accountable and say, Andrew, return 100 pages by Friday and, you know, keep things moving along. But from there, then I found it quite easy to upload it to Amazon, to get the book cover design done. Um, and then the marketing of it is kind of up to you, really, social media, so on and so forth, friends and family. No. Um, it kind of morphed into something else in that it, it became a bestseller on Amazon after a week and then an international bestseller because it sold hit number one in, in various different countries but as i said the book will live forever i won't i'm very proud of it bill you're writing a book on leadership so mm-hmm. you got to show some leadership and, and and get it done uh in your own time and what's the yeah. process that you you're, you've been taking to do this book? um i've been trying to divide it into uh into smaller bites mm-hmm. um you know because because uh, you know how to eat an elephant right <laughs> you take small bites <laughs> But uh, um, but yeah, and so uh, so I've been working on dividing it up into smaller and smaller pieces, um, so that uh, um, you know I've got all my headers done, and and then I'm going to have my subtopics and my sub subtopics, and <laughs> and uh, yeah, I may I may write this without writing a single paragraph. I don't know. <laughs> it's great. But no, uh, it's- um, but yeah, I'm hoping. No, I was going to say I'm hoping to uh, to do a, uh, a mastermind uh, associated with the book, so uh, so I'm going to have to do a workbook too. Oh, that's a great idea. The workbook yeah. is a very good idea for things like that. Yeah, but... you can you can borrow from that. Uh, go write your workbook for uh, for resilience. That's true. I was thinking <laughs> of doing something like that, but I, I've I've enough on my plate at the moment. But definitely, I mean, the book. You're not going to be a millionaire with a book, as everybody told no. me, and I found out. But it, it's an avenue and a vehicle to something else. So maybe mm-hmm. a workbook, training course, coaching, or when I'm 90, I look back, I want to say that I, I wrote my book rather than saying I wish I had written a book. So that's yeah. probably taking care of that. So yeah. Um, and Branko, what's your process for writing? I mean, yeah. what, also, what's your go-to and how you I, I also things? have a memoir, too. And you, yours, Bill, yours, oh, wow. is a mem- yours is a memoir also? That you're writing the leadership book? No, no, it... it's uh, oh. no, it's on uh, um, it's on something. Uh, I'm trying to decide whether to call it ethical leadership or virtuous leadership. Um, that's like nice. my biggest uh, my biggest trouble is, is deciding what to call it. Um, nice. But uh, um, but yeah, it's it's based on ten actionable behaviors, and and I've taught it before to to mostly to single and you know one one at a time to people. Um, but, uh, um, but yeah, I, uh, um, I've been in leadership now since the mid nineties. That was my first experience with, uh, um, you know, the Southern California guy, uh, he ought to know, uh, the, um, the tournament of roses parade is coming up. Uh, and that was my first, uh, my first leadership experience was, uh, um, was being in charge of the Cal Poly Rose Float Committee. And, wow. uh, we built a couple of, uh, well, the, this year will be the Cal Poly's, uh, 75th entry into the Tournament of Roses Parade. Uh, wow. mine were the 49th and 50th. Ooh. Yeah. And, uh, um, yeah. And, uh, um, then, uh, in the late, uh, 2000s, I went back to school, um, and, uh, for, uh, uh, for a degree in business, um, and, uh, um, uh, had uh, a dual uh, concentration on uh, marketing and management, and uh, um, and I found I had strengths in leadership uh, that uh, that were that went beyond uh, just uh, uh, picking the right people because that's what I thought I'd done, but uh, it turns out I was doing a lot more. <clears throat> and then uh, a few years ago, when I went back to back to school for uh, for a master's degree, um, they uh, the school in order to make sure I could write at a uh, at a graduate level. Um, made me take a class, and one of the books they had was about this. was a uh, was a chapter. They wanted me to do a write about a chapter in this book that was on uh, ethical leadership. 
and uh, and the guy's uh, methods and techniques and and uh, um, and his his basic idea, I just completely fell in love with it. And uh, um, and I've been studying it uh, and working on it bits and pieces ever since. And wow. now I'm finally uh, really starting the book. Amazing. I like the, yeah. I like the title Eth Ethical Leadership. Mm -hmm. I think that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really about it's really about bringing teams and communities together to prop up the leader instead of uh, instead of what a lot of a uh, lot of leadership techniques do is is make the leader a uh, an island unto him or herself. And uh, um, and this is the complete opposite of that. It's bringing everybody together to uh, to create a, a really a cohesive team and community and uh, um, and uh, get the world going in a in a better direction. One uh, one piece of it at a time. Beautiful. Very good. So, yeah. yeah. It sounds like a very exciting book. That's great. <laughs> I hope I, so. I, I hope, I it hope turns you, out exciting. I, I hope you I hope you enjoy <laughs> the process of creating it. You know, that's the main thing, not to work so far. On just yeah, just enjoy the process. Yes. Good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um yeah, I have been and uh yeah, people should uh, people should do it. It's uh, it's it, it can be a lot of fun. Um, I mean, it's a lot of work too, but uh, uh, but you know, it's it's fun to uh, to get the the writing part of it done. I'm not so sure about the whole editing and publishing part of it. That that doesn't sound as much fun. <laughs> could be. <laughs> yeah, I but, could. Uh, but I, I do know an editor, so. I, I think. I mean, I mean, just a few things I'd like to. Uh, Raka, you might be able to identify with this, but. Since my book has been out, there's uh, some things that I would love to have done, and I didn't do it. I should have put some pictures in there of myself uh. and my wife and Alfie because we're kind of central to the story. So it would have been a nice, more of a nice connection mm. for the uh, for the reader, I guess, because a lot well, of the, the second readers, edition. Yeah. Well, it, <laughs> what happened? So it's it's how did I get here? And the next one would be where did I go or why did I bother? <laughs> But there's always going to be things you want to include that you didn't think of, but, you know, getting structured and, and getting into the process. But the editor is the key to everything and let them handle that. I mean, you'll find a good editor, you know, someone. But yeah, isn't You want to make sure you give it your best shot if you're doing it. Is, is your book print on demand? It is print on demand. So I could upload a new file. But, yeah. you know, here's the sales guy in my head. I said, if I upload a new file, it takes a few days and I might miss a sale. <laughs> oh. oh, you can do it. I might get it. it done locally just for myself, you know. I don't, I don't, oh, you know. I think you should go for it. My wife will want pick certain pictures and you won't be happy with this picture and that picture. And we'll have to get some photo shoots done then probably where it should be spontaneous. But you know, I'm opening a big can of worms now. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, that you are. But just know that you can but, always add the photos if you want to. Yes. That's that's the that best thing that about print on demand. It's great. It's it's a terrific thing. Well, I, I missed, mm -hmm. What? Sorry, I I missed out the whole piece of that I could add in about getting the citizenship now as well. That's the next piece that I can yeah. add to the book too. So yeah, maybe it's going to keep evolving like we all do in our lives. We're always like yes. hey, you've moved state recently, that's a big move for you. Braca, you've got a big story here coming about Israel now. I mean, yeah. So you this know, you never know what to do. You should write a different book with your experiences. This, it's a new edition of my memoir. That's how I know that you know you could, and it's even got a new title. That was confusing, but we did it because we took it back from the publisher, and my children became the publisher. So it's got a whole new everything, and and that's. It's really exciting when you have a memoir. This is my only book for adults. There's it's there's now 42 books for children and just this one book for adults. And I don't write long things. I I it's a, it's a um a compilation like from my diaries and my journals and my letters. I just took the highlights. Wow. And I filled in the missing pieces, and that's how a, the person um, reading it experiences it along with me that way. Yeah, that's how that goes. Yeah. Yeah, well, so 
definitely two completely different uh, experiences with getting uh, with getting books published. Because um, Bracca, you've had uh, you've had uh, uh, books published traditionally with uh, with a big publishing house and all that. And now, of course, your kids do it. Um, right. Did things really change for you when your kids took over uh, publishing the books? It's just a blast working with them because they get so excited about everything. It's like such a joy to work <laughs> with the family. And um, they want to get my messages even further out into the world. It's the most gratifying feeling for me, you know, to do this. And both of them, my son and daughter-in-law are so creative and they're putting their creativity into it. So working together has been amazing. We, it's only been two years since we've been doing this and it's, it's just a real delight. Yeah. Hey, well, how, how is it, uh, how has it changed? How is it different now than it was before when you had a, an outside publisher? Um, other than, uh, other than your publisher now gets excited for your book. Uh, yeah, that's that's the big difference. That's a big difference. The enthusiasm, you know, it's tremendous because it was much more distant before with the publisher. You know, it wasn't. It was a more formal mm -hmm. relationship, and um, if I argued about something going in or coming out of the book, I wouldn't always win. You know, so it's a give and take. But I mean, mm. the same thing with my children, but. I guess they have even more respect for me. So it's, you know, <laughs> it's a very nice relationship. Yeah. Well, you're setting a yeah. great example for them as well, Bracca. You know, perhaps they want to pursue something like that in life too. That's great. You know, you're leading by example. Yeah. It's a really good well, really feeling. Really anything you can say that you want to pursue, I think is something special, you know, because you don't, you don't pursue a nine to five. You know, ooh, that's what I want to do with my life is work nine to five for somebody else. Uh, <laughs> it sounds exciting, this nine to five. I've got to get some. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh... <laughs> but, uh, um, but yeah, you, you pursue things like, uh, like a dream, uh, 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 writing that book or, uh, um, or making that movie. Yeah. Passion is big. Like if you really have an interest in something and you want to go after it, that's a pursuit. Yeah, but the, there was a time yeah, for sure. at, when I was home after raising my children for 17 years and I was home with, as a homemaker, I was really excited about getting a nine to five job, you know, and it was like a real change from being <laughs> at home. So there's certain times in your life that you might want that kind of structure, you know, and then there's other times where you could be a free spirit and break out and do your own thing. That's an amazing thing. There's so many different stages in life. And when you're in one, you can't even imagine that life is going to be so different years down the line. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Of course, when you're when you're at home raising kids, you don't get to go home at five. So <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry, right. kids. It's five o'clock. I'm, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> yep, exactly right. That I'm is done true. For today. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't work. Somehow that doesn't work, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so Andrew, big plans for uh, for the holidays? Yeah, I guess you know it, it's it. You know, Christmas Day falls on a Monday, so we've a nice long run in now from Friday when we finish work. Yeah, and it's all about Santa for Alfie. So we've been charting how many sleeps to Santa arriving. So I think we started <laughs> it too early. We started it with 22 sleeps to go. So the 3rd of December, we started that or the 2nd. But, <laughs> you know, we'll, 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 uh, we'll be in touch with family this weekend back in Ireland. Ireland uh, celebrates Christmas in a big way. So the country mm -hmm. kind of effectively shuts down from the 24th to about the 3rd of January. Wow. Oh, wow. But, and uh, we, we, you know, got to make sure that we're in touch with our Alfie's grandparents, my parents, Jane's parents, and nieces and nephews and cousins. But I'm going to Ireland on the uh, 4th of January. I fly in for four days for my father. He turns 90, so we're having a big celebration. Oh, wow. And he's, and he's still driving, Bill and Branca. Can you believe that at 90, he's still driving? Amazing. No wonder you're not in Ireland anymore. Right. <laughs> right. Yes. 
So, oh my gosh, amazing. On the occasions, very important, you know, to be there for us. 90, yeah, my father's not to 90 yet. He's, uh, he's still in his 70s, so he's got a ways yeah. to go. There you well. go. Yeah, my dad, my dad had me late in life like I had my son late in life. Wow. That's, thing. <laughs> That's so interesting. Yeah. And, and his, I, doctor, something... his doctor is about 91 years of age. So the doctor passed him fit to drive again. They play golf together, so the doctor doesn't drive. So I think what the doctor was doing was, I need to be able to get to the golf course. So I, I, better, uh, I better make sure Mr. Fitzgerald can drive me. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, they only go small, short trips. So. Wow. I want to ask you about what you mentioned in your book about throwing, like how corporate throws people under the bus. What does that mean? And how do you avoid it? Yeah, no, look, I mean, I've been very lucky. I've worked with some great brands and companies and they're all very good companies. Uh, but unfortunately, like everything else, like you come across people and personalities that you either just don't mesh with or, you know, there's some corporate, which I find very hard to say, corporate jealousy, you know. Um, I guess for me, I have, a, I have a strong work ethic, and when I'm doing something, I do it 100% to bring people with me. You know, it's not all the individual. It's the sum of all our efforts. But it's competitive. People want to get promoted, and, I, I mean, people will walk all over somebody else to get promoted. The I best see. one I can give you an example, and it's recounted in the book, is, is going to a board meeting where I was uh, on the agenda that I would leave the room for 40 minutes that they would talk about the business, but the board of directors said absolutely not. Um, wow. That I was to stay in, in, in the room. And then the person that was presenting was, you know, had was presenting a completely distorted story and situation about the company's sales. And if you want to ask mm. somebody about sales, then you ask me because I'm the head honcho. I know the sales. Wow. And um, I guess it was very cringe for that person that was talking because I was still in the room, whereas originally, I was going to be not in the room wow. while she was throwing me under the bus, literally saving wow. her own skin. Uh, mm. And she left the company two days later. So the board wow. of directors backed me. Wow. Um, but there's times you've got to sink or swim, and I'll always try and swim. It's happened many times, and I'll say, well, you know, I'm not absolutely going to stand for that. I'm going to say it in the right forum if that's in a, in a meeting and say, I'm sorry, I think you're incorrect on that. Or, you know, I'll have a conversation with someone one-on-one -on -one afterwards and, what we say in Ireland is mark their card. In other words, you know, hey, we're not going to stand for that again if it happens again. Or you have mm -hmm. to protect yourself. Um, it's a company. It's not a family. And people get lost in that, you know. And um, we want to be a good environment. But sometimes your values, my values of respect and integrity, they're the top two things. And they mean different things to different people. But I, I'll yeah. never compromise those being, um, you know, being messed with. So. Yeah, I mean, there's always something. You always conflict in a company, but you can find a way to re find resolution too. But I think we should have respect in everything we do. And on occasions, people haven't shown me respect. And um, you have to deal with that too, you know? Yeah, great. Yeah. Well, it's important to, uh, to, keep, uh, to keep values in mind. Um, mm. You know, we, we, had a, we were having a conversation the other day about uh, um, that no one thinks of themselves as the villain of the story. And uh, so everybody's got some value in uh, that they're, that they're acting on. It just may not be a common value, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and really? uh, I think, um, I know absolutely different, different values for different folks, but it's been challenging for me too, because I see things happening and, you know, I'd say, Oh, will I step in here to help a good a team member, you know, or if I saw mm -hmm. somebody, you know, getting unfair criticism, but, you know, it's not my battle to fight either. You know, that's, that's the conflict I've had down through the years. You know, you can't save everybody. You've got to, put, got to mind yourself to in the corporate world. But, right. yeah, I think that sometimes managers get promoted that aren't necessarily ready to manage people, mm -hmm. uh, to coach people. It's because they were very good in their individual role. Right. But now you may be, you know, leading a team of seven or eight people that are all very different individuals, different nationalities cultures, ethnicities, um, and a different skill set. So I think, you know, ongoing yeah. leadership training is something that most people should, in the corporate world, avail of. Mm -hmm. Maybe read Bill's book on ethical leadership. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, they should. Taking orders right now.
for a limited time only. For a limited time only. <laughs> pre-order, pre-order. That's yeah, a, you I might know, have a, I'm pre-order. What, what, it, do you have any ideas based on that ethical leadership of mm -hmm. what could work in the Middle East? I'm, I'm really serious. How do you use that idea of teams supporting a leader? What could work here? I mean, mm -hmm. we really, we really need all kinds of creative well, ideas to get a solution. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, really, what I think, uh, I think a lot of it could boil down to is thinking of others first. You know, the old, uh, the old, old golden rule: um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and uh, and not before they do to you. Um, you know, but. Uh, um, you know, if people if people were more others focused, I think the world would be a much better place. Nice. And uh, um, you know, people would feel better about themselves um, because I I found that uh, um, that that uh, um, that depression and anger and a lot of those things are because a person's self focused. Right. They're they're so inwardly uh, inwardly focused on uh, on their lives that it 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 makes one angry. And right. uh, um, and can make one depressed, right? And and addictions. Yeah. So, uh, addictions so yeah, others just, first. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and that yep, for sure. you know, I think, yeah, I think the um, what's it called, the Abraham Accords. I think that was based on that mm -hmm. idea to to try to what could benefit countries so that we could have a friendship here in the Middle East. You know, I, um. I right. think that had that type of other outlook as opposed to gimme, gimme. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it was m more about how could all these countries benefit by getting along? <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's, if, if everybody had that mentality and that's what was spreading and that was a great thing, it was going in a good direction uh, when that was happening, I think. Um, and you know, it's it's the other ideas of of just wiping people out and eradicating their existence and things like that that mm -hmm. just don't know how to deal. How do you deal with people that are saying those things? You know, and no, it just it just doesn't fit. It's it's a very difficult mm -hmm. situation. Uh, well, even even if you do get rid of the people who are very different from you, there's always going to be some difference between you and your neighbor. That's right. you know, if if that's your mentality of getting rid of those right. who are different, then well, then you're going to get rid of them too. Um, right. You know, you look at the right. way uh, at the way water is handled in the Middle East. I mean, it's definitely a valuable resource. Uh, um, you know, but. Uh, um, but you know, countries are 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 building dams and 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 drying up. Uh, you know, the Tigris and the Euphrates are not as as full of water as they once were because different countries are taking uh, you know, what they feel they deserve of it. And so it's like, so even though these are all going through Arab countries, again, it's some slight difference is enough to justify. Oh, let's get uh, rid of them. And I see. Uh, and. You know, I so, uh, um, so yeah, so yeah, even right. if you take the big religious difference out of the, uh, out of the equation, there's still something. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, look, Ireland, as I mentioned at the top of the conversation, look, Ireland is a 32 county country mm -hmm. and the best way to get peace was to, to carve it up. 26 were, counties are in the Republic and six were in Northern Ireland and the six in Northern Ireland were going to be ruled by England. Right. And the, and the war in Ireland, as I said, we called it the Troubles, was uh, over land and religion, Catholic, mm -hmm. Protestant. But eventually, uh, a harmonious um, agreement was reached, I guess, where, you know, there's peace in, in Ireland now, albeit still the six counties are ruled and owned by England. But my generation would look at the country as one country. So, but a lot of people, unfortunately, have to lose their lives to get there. And it, yeah. modern warfare nowadays is what we're seeing in Israel is far worse than what was happening in the 70s and 80s in Ireland. You do social media where you see everything as well now. So, but I mean, eventually there will be a harmonious 
solution. Uh, but how many more lives have to be lost before you can get there? So yeah. what 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 brought peace to Ireland? How did they? How did peace come? I think there's a war that no. Yeah, I think eventually they just realized there was a war that no one was ever going to win. Uh, but a lot of negotiation, a lot of talks, and a lot of coming coming together to speak. I think it was, but I think America played a great role in uh -huh. being that um, uh, honest broker, if you want to call them that, or a I broker see. to peace. I, I think see. That, you know, I think around Bill Clinton was the president at the time and um, would have been very influential in getting all sides to the table to talk and discuss because it was just going nowhere, uh, you know, and it's better to live in a harmonious society um, oh, that, than that, have conflict. It makes me hopeful remembering about Ireland because I remember when and now you don't hear about these problems anymore in Ireland that that's it's a, it's a very hopeful sign for me what you're talking about yes yeah I mean I don't think there'll ever will be as what we would call a united Ireland because there's just too many things there like you'd have to get England would eventually have to give up ruling the six counties and I just don't see them doing that and that's fine but we can live within in, in the current setup without conflict and there's no sign of it ever resurfacing again. So it's probably a good template as to how to solve stuff, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's not going to work everywhere too, of course. But, um, yeah, I mean, as, as the social media stuff is really hammered at home, like where you get to see these things, some things you don't want to see. And once right. you see something, you can't unsee it. And, um, so, uh, it's a very tricky, difficult situation. I can imagine someone banging on my door here in Oceanside in the middle of a war, me thinking that this is it, you know. So, I mean, I, you have to keep yourself safe and, and hope that people will do the right thing and, and get around the table and, and come to a ceasefire anyway, at least. Stop lobbing grenades into, into people's yards. Yes. Uh, yeah, so, so, all I got to worry about here is some guy throwing his leaves over, cutting his trees <laughs> and the leaves falling in my yard. The grenades is totally different. <laughs> I know. I've never experienced yep. war before in my life, you know, so this is a first time for me. Um, and people say, well, why don't you leave and go back to the States, you know, but it's a significant time in our history. I, I'm not about to leave, you know, so I'll be going back, but I'm, I'm not leaving because of the war. You know, I'll go back when I was planning to go back, but hopefully, yeah. Yeah, well, we've uh, we've come full circle, and uh, and all um, <laughs> back to where we started from, uh, trying to solve yeah. the problems of the world. Yes. Uh, only how we we can all solve problems, but other people have to implement them. Yep. <laughs> yep. Make other people do the work. <laughs> Rocket, no, it's get to a work. Joy. It's really it's 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 such a joy to connect with you, and I. This is what I love about technology. I to share with people in all parts of the world and, and and it's one of my favorite things about doing podcasts and with people from all different religions. And I, I talk to many people that are Muslim too, and it's just so wonderful because you realize this is the, my best way of connecting on a podcast, not in person right now, you know? So <laughs> It's it's mm -hmm. it's just so great because you realize you have all so much in common. We all share the yeah. same soul energy, you know. It and we all there's really goodness inside of everybody, and it's it's just it's just great to see. Yeah, so I'm I'm really happy to be sure. here, and I love I love that you're doing this. I and it, I love the whole format of having. The bunch of us together, it's a great thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Well, um, before uh, before we wrap things up, uh, I'll ask, uh, do you have anything to say to the nice people? Any final words? I would say to anyone listening and watching is, you know, you know happy holidays, happy Christmas, happy new year. Be the best you can be, you know, uh, chase mm -hmm. your, your dreams, trust yourself 100% and back yourself. And um, make 2024 and every year after, go go chase those pursuits and passions and live your life. Yeah. You know, you only get one shot at this, so enjoy yourself. 
If it's write a book, write a book. If it's join a band, join a band. If it's change career, <laughs> I don't advocate changing relationships, but if that's what you got to do, do that too. You know, whatever it is that makes you happy, go chase it. Okay. How about you, Bracca? Yeah, and and it's that's the title of my memoir, Nourish the Soul. We we have to do. And, and, oh, the subtitle is filling the emptiness within. There's an emptiness and, and, and we have hungry souls and we fill it by bringing lasting pleasure into our lives. How do we find lasting pleasure in life? Through gratitude. Be grateful because everybody has so much to be grateful for. It's focusing on what we're missing. That's what creates our own misery and global misery, focusing on this tiny little piece of land that they don't have, you know, that they've got all this other land, yeah. but this one little piece. So it's like, um, it's, it's, it's that way for everybody. Don't focus on it. Just let us be and everybody else do your own thing. I don't know, but like it, it's, 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 it's that part that is, everybody has it and it's totally natural that is working on all of us to get us to focus on what we're missing when we all have so much to be grateful for right this moment, every moment, every yes, person. Do. And uh, gratitude is definitely a good thing to, uh, to focus on because once you're thankful for the things you have, the things you don't have don't seem to matter quite as much. Right. So, uh, well um, so uh, thank you both uh, for being on the show. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, um, remember to be safe out there. Uh, have yourselves a great, uh, a great holiday season and new year. And uh, remember to wash your hands and stay tuned for the ending credits. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been a presentation of Bald Spots Productions. I'd like to thank our producer, my beloved mother, Eileen Hatch. I, of course, am your humble host. I'd also like to thank my special guests, Andrew Fitzgerald, fan of the show, global beverage sales expert, and author of How Did I Get Here? Traveling the Road to Resilience. And Bracca Getz, the Harvard-educated author of 42 children's books and one book for grown-ups. Support the show if you feel so led over on Patreon.com. We're known as Bald Spots Pro. Don't you dare miss YWL Online. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, and wherever fine podcasts are offered. Be sure to tune in next time when my special guests will be Udo Erasmus, author of Fats That Heal, Fats That Kill, and Rusty McDonald, host of Living and Thriving with Rusty, author and speaker. Be sure to like, comment, and share. You know, subscribe, follow, whatever it is you've got to do to kick that algorithm into gear and help us reach more people. If you or someone you know needs support now, call or text 988 or chat 988lifeline.org. That is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline here in the United States.